The last time uh, I stood here, I was talking about the church, about the gathering, how, where it all started, and we have traced the, the origin of how the concept of the church was, was born. And, and we found out that it was coming from the mouth of Jesus in, when he said to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they started uh, quoting uh, the, the opinions of the crowds. And to their surprise, Jesus asked them a leading question. And as if Jesus is saying, I'm not interested in what the, wor- what the crowds are, the opinions of the crowds, what matters most to me is you. I spent time with you for almost three and a half years. And is there any one of you who, who knows and recognizes my true identity? And, and there was a silence among the disciples. And all of a sudden, Peter stood up and said, Lord, you are the Christ. But I can recognize you that you are the Christ. You're not just one of the prophets. You're not just Elijah or Jeremiah or John the Baptist. Or you're not just one of the prophets. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter, it does not reveal to you by man, but by my Father revealed it to you. And he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And he was telling Peter, Peter, it is not happening yet. It is something in the future. I will build my church. And you watch out for it, Peter, because this church, neither the grave, generations will pass, will pass away. Even you will pass away. But this movement that I'm going to start will not be conquered and will not, it will be unstoppable. And we have learned that in Acts chapter 2, it was the day of the Pentecost. The Jewish people from different parts of the world were going and, my, um, and convening in Jerusalem for the festival. And it was that day that God launched the church, the ecclesia. And we found out that the church has nothing to do with buildings. It has nothing to do with, with location. It has something to do with people who are gathered, who believed and recognized that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The church was launched based on the resurrection of Jesus. Because the church grew, as 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 Luke described, that the Lord added to their number daily. The church expanded and there were 3,000 who were converted. And they were all baptized according to Luke. And then miracles after miracles happened uh, through the disciples. And the church continued to expand and increase rapidly. They increased to about 4,000 and about 5,000 uh, believers. And they started to threaten the balance of power between the Roman Empire and the Jewish leaders. In my last sermon, it says, the apostles, according to Luke, when they were, when they were called to the Sanhedrin and they were asked to stop preaching the name of Jesus and stop preaching about the resurrections of Jesus, they were threatened and said, you should not continue preaching that. They were threatened unless something bad is going to happen to you. As bold witnesses, their loyalty was tested. And this is the verse how Luke summarized and described the reaction of the apostles, the twelve. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Why? Because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. Day after day, according to Luke, Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, after the flogging, after they, would, they, would, they have been released and they have been threatened not to preach the name and the resurrection of Jesus, the reactions of the disciples day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, because that's where the church were meeting, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. What can we see about the early church, the early gathering, the early community of believers? That they were unstoppable indeed. We will understand today how the gospel came out of Jerusalem and reached the then known world and even up to our time today. The title of, I'm going to share with you this sermon. And here's the title, My Chosen Instrument, based on Acts chapter 9, which we will find out later. Now, in chapter 5, we ended with, that they continue preaching. In, in chapter 6, what happened to the ecclesia, the gathering, according to Luke, the church grew in number. It's really unstoppable. The growth of the church was growing so rapidly. And because of that, they decided to choose 12 or 7 deacons. Now the hierarchy of the church, the structure of the church started to develop. So they chose 7 faithful men filled with the Holy Spirit. So one of them, one of the 7 deacons that were chosen was Stephen. And because the apostles decided to relinquish the, the other 
ministry tasks so that they can concentrate in prayer and the study of the Word. Here's the, here's the reaction of, of what happened according to Luke. Luke said, because of that, the Word of God spread. Because the apostles were freed up. And the result of that, the delegation of works in the ministry in, the, in, in, in Ecclesia was the church grew rapidly. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased. And a large number of priests. Luke is saying not only a common people were receiving and embracing the faith, even the priests. In chapter 6, if you read Acts chapter 6 tonight and chapter 7, Stephen uh, was arrested. Maybe the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, who persecuted the apostles were saying, if we cannot stop the apostles, in, in spite of the flogging, in, in spite of weeping their backs, they continued preaching and they never stopped preaching the gospel. What can we do now? And they saw this young leader, Stephen, preaching as well, copying, maybe uh, doing the same thing that the apostles were doing. And maybe the religious leader was saying, let's, let's deal with this young leader. If we cannot deal with the old ones, the senior one, maybe we can threaten this young, this young leader. And in chapter 6 and chapter 7, if you read Acts, Stephen, when he was facing the Sanhedrin, they thought they could uh, intimidate this young leader. Stephen preached a very good sermon. Read it in your own free time. Chapter 6, chapter 7. Stephen preached from the time of the, of the choosing of Abraham and he connected how Jesus was the promised Messiah. It, it was a long preaching. And at the end of his preaching, he antagonized again the religious leaders and provoked again the religious leaders because saying, you were the reason and again, you were the one who put this Jesus, the promised Messiah, on the cross. And here's the reaction of the religious leaders when they heard Stephen's preaching. And when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up. This is in front of the Sanhedrin. And he said, and he saw heaven, the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand. And here's what Stephen said. Look in front of the Sanhedrin. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He saw heaven open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God because that was about the time when Stephen was dragged out of that place by the religious leaders. Look at the response of the religious. At this, they covered their ears and they were yelling. It is like blasphemy with the one I hear such blasphemous words. They all rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Not small pebbles of stone, but rocks that put Stephen eventually to death. Stephen was the first martyr of the gathering of the ecclesia. First time where the persecution was fueled by the preaching of Stephen and he was stoned by the religious leaders and put him to death. The blood of the martyrs had begun to be the seed of the church because at this juncture, Something was about to be introduced to us. Something was about to be, uh, to be introduced by Luke. This, this is probably one of the turning points in the book of Acts. Because in, in chapter 7, after this, Luke said, Meanwhile, while the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, listen carefully. Luke, as the historian, is about to introduce a new character. And this man that Luke is about to introduce will play a major role in the expansion of the church. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Who was Saul? Saul was the apostle that we know Paul today. Who was Saul? Saul was a young Pharisee. If you read the background of Saul, Saul was a young Pharisee who was mentored by Gamaliel. Remember Gamaliel, the, the rabbi who was who was saying, let's not, uh, let's not kill these apostles, but rather give them, release them, because if it is, not, if it is of human origin, this will, this will not su be successful. Remember Gamaliel, the last time I talked about uh, the persecution of the apostles? Gamaliel mentored this young man Saul, and he was a promising Pharisee. It is important for us to understand because Saul will be the prime persecutor of the church, of the gathering. So Saul, as a Pharisee, what he was doing when he was standing there giving approval to the stoning of Stephen because for him, he thought that what he was doing was serving God. Acts chapter 8 
And Saul was there giving approval to the death of Stephen. This is the first time there was someone who was killed in the movement, the first martyr. And in Luke continue by describing, and on that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and take note, all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Remember Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Samaria, in Judea and Samaria. See, the words of Jesus is was slowly being fulfilled. God may be using persecution. God may be using something that is so bad that happened in, in, in their time to spread them so that it will also be a fulfillment of what he was saying, that you will be my witnesses. And while they were scattered, they were preaching. And on the other hand, here comes Luke saying that God, some godly men buried Stephen, mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, the gathering, the ecclesia, going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. It was only summarized to us by Luke because if he will detail what really happened, many hundreds of followers of Jesus were dragged by Paul. And those who were scattered, those who ran away and fled, those who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. Even when they were fleeing, they were preaching. God used the scattering of the disciples so that the gospel will be spread throughout the Asia Minor, the time, wherever they went. And we found out, if you read the book of Acts, the church in Antioch was born. And the persecution lasted for several months, if not years. And in chapter 9, let's fast forward, chapter 9 of, of, of Acts, meanwhile, as Luke was recording, he said, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats. He was also unstoppable in his own rights. Meanwhile, while Saul was still breathing out murderous threats, against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priests. You see how zealous he was? Because he thought what he was doing, he was doing God a favor. And, and Saul, the Pharisee, asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found any, any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoner in Jerusalem. And here comes Saul asking for warrant of arrest. License to stone or license to kill anyone who belong to the way. Because he got the letter from the high priest. You know what, did, what Saul did? He was so adamant in persecuting and arresting the followers of Jesus. He got this letter. Maybe he called some people to accompany him. Maybe they were riding horses or whatever. They went to Damascus to arrest the Jews who fled Jerusalem, the Christians. And take note of this. Something is interesting is going to happen on the road to Damascus. Now, if you're familiar with Acts, probably you have read this. But for those who are not familiar of the history of the, of the ecclesia, of the church, this is something interesting. And I want you to take note very carefully. And he, here comes Luke saying, as he, referring to Saul, with his company of soldiers or whatever, or young priest, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And how did the Saul react? He fell to the ground. That's how Luke described. Because the light flashed from heaven, he fell, Saul, he fell to the ground and heard the voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then Saul was saying, he heard the voice recalling and said, who, Saul, Saul, who, why are you persecuting me? And I want you to listen very carefully. Saul or Paul may be confused to hear a voice from heaven because as a Pharisee, a voice from heaven is always associated as a voice from God. Take note, Saul was a Pharisee, a religious leader. A voice from heaven for them is always linked or associated from the voice of God. And it's an, an interruption like that is somehow also sometimes looked at as a rebuke from God. And, and maybe Paul was confused because for him, he was not persecuting God. Maybe for Paul, for Saul, he was arguing, Lord, what, what did you say? Why do you persecute me? I am not persecuting you. That's why the second verse or the second line, he said this, 
Who are you, Lord? Curious, who are you, Lord, Master? Who are you, Lord? And here's the response that confused him more. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. I am not, it was not detailed in the description of Luke, but he, was, he fell from this horse. He was confused because how can God interrupt my, my mission? I'm doing this for you. I am not persecuting you, Lord. I'm confused. Who are you, Lord? And the more he got puzzled because the voice that talked to him out from that encounter of light from heaven, I am Jesus, the very person, the name that the apostles and the disciples were preaching. The very teaching about the resurrection that they were denying. That they were telling them to stop preaching the name of Jesus because this is a lie. And he was face to face with the founder of the church, alive with the recent Jesus. Why do you persecute me? And a realization here, two realizations of Saul. The first realization of Saul is, I thought I am serving you, God. Now I know that you're alive. He can face to face with Jesus. The second realization of, of Paul or Saul here is that if I persecute your people, it is the same thing as I persecute you because what you have done to these followers of mine, you are doing it to me. In other words, we as the gathering, the ecclesia, the followers of Jesus, when we are gathered as a church, we represent Christ. That's why if the church brings reproach, if the church is not, is not behaving the way we are supposed to behave, then we bring reproach and shame to the name of Christ because we are the representation of God in this world, of Christ in this earth. No wonder when Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he was saying, Corinthians, don't you know that you yourselves are the temple of God in Corinth? You are the house of God. You are representing God in that place. So Paul realized here that what I do to, to his people, I do it to you. Now Jesus continued instructing Paul or Saul and he said, Now get up. Now get up, Saul, and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. And here, Luke describing, in Damascus there was a disciple. It gets interesting here. When Paul was led to Damascus, and on that side of the world, in Damascus, the Lord was saying, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. There was a follower of Christ who are a native of Damascus. And he called to him in a vision, and Ananias said, Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Detail. And ask for a man from Tarsus, for he was praying. Look at the description. Ask for a man named Saul from Tarsus in the house of Judas at the straight street. Now, I am not sure of the reaction here of Ananias. There was a news that many Christians or many followers who belong to the way have been dragged by this number one persecutor named Saul, the Pharisee, and put them to prison. And here comes, they all heard that Saul, the Pharisee, was on his way to Damascus to arrest those who belong to the way. And here comes the Lord revealing himself to Ananias and said, Ananias, I want you to go to the house of Judas in the straight street because of the name Saul. Look for the man Saul because he was praying. And look at the, reac the reaction of Ananias. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Are you sure, Lord? It's too dangerous, Lord. He came here looking for us. I should not be going there looking for him. Diba? Lord, he came here with a warrant of arrests. And all of a sudden, in a vision, God was speaking to Ananias. No, I want you to go there. Because he saw a vision that a man named Ananias is coming to lay his hand on him so that he would receive his sight. He was a chosen instrument as well. And the reaction here, and he has come here, according to Ananias, he has come here with the authority from the high priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, 
in the vision he was talking to him, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and before the people of Israel. Interesting, no? How God would choose people to be part of His greater plan. Lord, are you, are you sure? He is the number one enemy of the gathering. He is the number one enemy of the church. He is all against you. But God or Jesus knew that Paul was doing it out of ignorance. Don't worry about that, Ananias. He is my chosen instrument. Go. Go. And I have chosen this man to bring the gospel outside of Jerusalem. I will show him how much he would suffer for my name. And then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. Listen carefully. He went there to the house of Judas in the straight street. And maybe, maybe he was looking outside, from outside to the window. Maybe he was looking, is that Saul? Maybe there was fear. But look at this Ananias and said, Brother Saul, Brother Paul. He called him a brother. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you. Look at the confirmation of what happened to you on the, on the road to Damascus. You are coming here. He has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He has sent me. Remember you saw a vision that a man by the name of Ananias will come and place lady son on you. I am that man. And look recorded immediately. The description of the historian, something like scales, fell from, the soul, from Saul's eyes and he could see again and he got up and was baptized. Many great men and women today of the gospel, very little are mentioned about those that God used to bring the gospel to them. Who shared the gospel to Billy Graham? Paul was used by God tremendously for the kingdom. And look how, how Luke described. After taking some food, he regained his strength and Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. A complete turnaround. He was there to arrest those who belong to the way. He does not believe that Jesus rose from the dead or that He is the promised Messiah. But in that encounter, Saul began preaching in Damascus. All those who heard him were astonished. No wonder when they were listening to Saul, maybe in there they were saying, maybe this is his style, his trick, so that he would arrest all of us. They were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? And look at the description of of the historian. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Remember, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Saul became part of the unstoppable gathering of Jesus. If you read the book of Acts, Galatians, and even his own account of what happened after that Damascus Experience Saul went to Arabia for some years. After preaching in Damascus, he went to Jerusalem, spent two weeks with Peter, absorbing everything what he could, what he could learn from Peter. And he spent time with James. When he went to Jerusalem, the apostles were scared. Only Barnabas took the courage and said, No, 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 this is an authentic follower of Christ. He brought Paul or Saul to be part of the apostle or the church. And Paul continued to absorb everything, trying to re reconcile his mistaken understanding of who Jesus was and learning and learning and learning, absorbing for many, many years. And after that, the rest is history. Just a quick, a quick look of what happened. That after that encounter in Jerusalem, after Paul would go to, uh, to Arabia and, and learn and absorb and everything and prepare himself, he launched to what we have known, what we know today as the first, second, third missionary journey of Paul. I could hear, I could hear Paul was saying to the 12 apostles, 
you take Jerusalem and give me the rest of the world. Because Paul, he was not only a Hebrew of a Hebrew, a pure Jew, he was also a Roman citizen and he was leveraging on his, on his Roman citizen that I could travel to any parts of the world. I could, I could go there and preach. I am a Roman citizen. They will give me enter or entry entrance to any, any cities in this world because I am a Roman citizen as well. And Paul was saying to the apostles, take charge of Jerusalem, preach the gospel to the Jews, give me the rest of the world. And look what happened. All those key cities in the Asia Minor, Paul started planting little ecclesia, little gatherings in all those small cities in, in Antioch, in Athens, in Ephesus. Look at all the letters that we have in the New Testament. The Corinthians, he went to Corinth, he went to Thessalonica. He planted little gathering or ecclesia in every major cities in that then known world. The first imprisonment of Paul in Rome, he was put in a house arrest where he wrote all the prison epistles that we know today, Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, Philippians. He wrote those epistles when he was in house arrest. Sending to those churches, he planted a small gathering. He would encourage them. There was no email. There was no Facebook during that time. But Paul was not hindered by the, in, in the, the lack of it. According to history, maybe Paul was released. After two years, he got arrested again and placed in a dungeon in Rome. And in AD 66, Paul was beheaded in Rome. Bad things can happen to all of us, no matter how faithful and righteous we are. But God is still on the throne. And for us to realize that we are just part of the bigger story of what God is doing in this world. Saul was beheaded. The Christians were not murmuring, welcome, oh, come good, bad things happen. But the more they became bolder, the more they became courageous in sharing the gospel. And you know, see Paul, Paul was the highly educated person. And he was able to summarize the gospel of how to present the gospel to a non-Jewish person who has no Old Testament background. And I would close with that statement of Paul in 1 Corinthians. Take note of this, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul was writing to a local church and he was giving now the synopsis of the gospel. And those years of experience and hearing from the apostles, he was able to summarize, reduce what is complicated in a simple way for those who have no Old Testament background, still we can understand what's the main thing, the gospel. And he said this in Corinthians and he was writing them, Now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. He was writing to an ecclesia. For what I received, I pass unto you of first importance, the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That he was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. The witnesses of the living Savior. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Maybe we don't know this. Jesus appeared to more than 500 witnesses at the same time. And Paul was saying to the Corinthians, if you doubt it, why don't you buy a ticket and go to Jerusalem because some of them are still alive. Then he continued, then he appeared to James and to all the apostles and last of all, he appeared to me. Listen, he was trying now to say, he appeared to me on the road to Damascus in several instances. I am abnormally born for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church, the little gathering, the ecclesia. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and this grace to me, and His grace to me was not without effect. Brothers and sisters, it is by the grace of Jesus that we are saved. It is the gift. Maybe you still have a lot of questions in your mind. But this is of first importance. That Christ died for your sins. 
Every believer is a chosen instrument today. For all of us who are attending this little gathering, that's this ecclesia in YMCA, for all of us here attending this church, we are as well His chosen instruments. Listen carefully. As His chosen instruments, we must view all life as means by God, given by God to us, in order to let the world hear and know that the gospel and eventually embrace the faith in Jesus. Just like Paul, he viewed life, he viewed all of his life as means so that God will be, may accomplish His purpose in his life. We are His chosen instruments today. Maybe you are, you are God's Paul to your family. Maybe you are God's Paul to your office. Chosen to bring across the message of salvation.